Yeah, so thanks, Tarek, and uh, thanks to all the organisers for inviting me to speak today. Um, so uh, I'll just give a very quick background, given that some of the um, data has already been presented around immunology and immunotherapy in um, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, but then um, talk perhaps more about thinking about novel trial designs for um, uh, patients with high-grade serous cancer in the context of a clinical trial that, um, that um, I'm leading. Uh, so uh, this has been presented already, but just to, by way of background, that high-grade serous ovarian cancer is the most common type of epithelial ovarian cancer and is characterised by um, very common um, uh, deficiencies in homologous recombination and um, p53 mutations, and that rather than it being driven by somatic um, uh, mutations, that it's really... Um, a disease of very high copy number alterations. And um, Linda already presented this before, but just to point out that um, ovarian cancer sits somewhere in the uh, left to the middle um, in this um, chart, which describes the um, frequency, oh, sorry, the mutational burden in these various different cancers in relevance to the frequency of formation of neoantigens, which is thought to be an important uh, uh, potential correlate for immune response. Um, this has already been discussed as well, but um, Richard Tothill and others in an, um, David's lab, um, now 10 years ago, it's the 10-year anniversary of this, um, uh, identified these four molecular subtypes based on gene expression in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and we called them C1, C2, C4, and C5, and I'm sure David still regrets the whole C3 situation. <laughs> um, C3 is low-grade serous cancer. Um, but uh, these are then subsequently being validated in different cohorts to be associated with um, differences in survival. So there's uh, potentially prognostic factors. And I think Liz mentioned this before as part of the ICGC study that we don't quite know whether these are um, fixed or dynamic. And that certainly in this cascade rapid autopsy study patient, there was a change in their um, molecular subtype from their primary diagnosis um, to the autopsy um, uh, sample. And I'll come back to discussing that a bit later. Um, so, despite, you know, there's been a lot of interest in these subtypes and, um, you know, well, what, what else is it um, useful for? And, you know, that it's been 10 years since they were first identified. And this, um, this study was published in Clinical Cancer Research last year, looking at um, data from patients that have been treated on a clinical trial of um, carboplatin paclitaxel versus carboplatin paclitaxel and bevacizumab in the frontline setting. And this identified that patients with the C1 or the C5 um, subtype appeared to benefit or have a greater benefit from the addition of the antigen, antigenic drug bevacizumab. Now, um, in part, that my, my somewhat um, controversial view is that, that that's in part because those, if you look at the control um, groups, that the C1 and C5, as we know, are actually doing extremely poorly in, relevant, in comparison to the C2 and C4 groups. And so maybe that's why they're doing um, somewhat better with the addition of the bevacizumab. That's speculative, not proven. <laughs> Uh, so now talking about immune landscape, and um, Terex already mentioned this study. Um, this is, how long is that? 15 years since George Kukos and his group um, reported this um, observation, um, that patients whose tumours had a higher till count had a better overall survival, and that this was subsequently validated um, in a paper published last year from the Otter Consortium, which many members of the room are involved in, showing, again, in a much larger cohort of over 3,000 samples that a high CD8 um, count in the tumour, and these um, analysis, they excluded the stroma, um, appeared to have a much better prognosis. And this was also seen in a couple of other um, histological subtypes, in emetroid and mucinous ovarian cancers. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about high-grade serous cancer today, but clearly... Um, you know, there are other histological types which are very important and often difficult to treat. Interestingly, they didn't see this same observation in ovarian clear cell cancers, which are thought to be somewhat more immunogenic, but um, based on their gene expression similarities to renal clear cell cancers. Um, but, uh, yeah, they didn't see this same um, interaction. 
Um, PDL1, um, so yeah, Tarek alluded to the fact that PDL1 expression has been um, noted to be important, particularly in non small cell lung cancer, as a potential biomarker for response to single agent immunotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, it certainly can be um, identified in high grade serous cancer. And you, as you can see here, in the combination of patients who had high CD8 and PDL1 expression, those patients seem to um, have a much um, better outcome as well. Uh, Dale and others already have reported about this, um, about the BRCA tumours appearing to, sorry, patients with BRCA mutant or homologous recombination deficient tumours being, um, having a higher TIL count, um, but that this seemed to be mostly um, related to BRCA1 rather than BRCA2. Um, and, you know, whether there's some differences between those um, two different um, groups of patients, I, I suspect there probably is. Um, in addition, um, I think Linda mentioned this earlier, that the C2 subgroup or C2 molecular subgroup, which we think of as immune reactive, the, um, is also enriched for um, BRCA1 um, mutant tumours, but not BRCA2 for some reason. Um, heterogeneity, I think... Um, Liz and Olga's talks were pretty scary for um, clinicians looking at these tumours going, oh my goodness, how much is going on in these tumours and how are we going to overcome all of this degree of heterogeneity? Um, but this was a really nice study from um, a cell paper last year that used took only one patient um, and sampled all of these different sites looking at various different immune markers, showing that there was quite a variation in the... Um, uh, CD8 um, and CD4 counts across the different um, anatomical sites. And what relevance this has clinically, I, I think that's still somewhat unknown. So then if we try to put those two things together, um, molecular subtype and immune landscape, um, I think it's quite clear that the four different molecular subtypes actually vary in terms of their immune landscape. And uh, this is figures taken from the original um, Tothill paper showing that the C1 and C2 subgroups do still express quite high levels of these immune-related genes, but that the C1s differ because they express these very high um, stromal-related genes. And that this C1, or what's called the mesenchymal subtype, is associated with desmoplasia and a very high CD3-positive T cells in the stroma, but not in the tumour, um, and you can see that on the h and &E section on the right there, that um, you see a lot more brown dots um, in the C2, and you see some brown dots in the C1, but they're all um, stuck in the stromal component, um, and that was quantified in the um, figures down below. Um, what's interesting is I, I was listening to Peter's talk, and that, that it seemed that both um, stroma and epithelial um, uh, tills were important in, in breast cancer, and... and uh, you know, all, most of the work in, in high grade series has really been in relation to the TILs in tumour. Um, right, so this is a study trying to, I suppose, um, work that out in a bit more detail. And they took 143 tumour samples from 21 different patients and did quite comprehensive um, uh, assays of um, genomics and um, RNA seq and immune profiling. And they broke it down into three different groups, N-TIL, S-TIL, and ES-TIL. So N is no TILs, S is stromal, and ES is um, both within the epithelium and the stroma. And essentially what they saw was that in these patients that had what they called N-TILs, these were enriched for the C5 molecular subtype, and they had very low CD4, CD8, and CD20 T cells within both epithelium and stroma and in relation to that low expression of genes relating to antigen presentation, processing, chemokines, cytokines, and T-cell effector functions. In contrast, the S-TILs, or the stromal TILs, were enriched for the C1 subgroup, and they had very high expression of um, these genes relating to um, immune functions. Um, and then finally, the ES-TIL group, which um, they saw was um, enriched for the C2, or immune reactive um, subgroup. So what does that all mean? Um, so I think of it in some ways a little bit simplistically like this, that if you break those four subgroups down, you have the C1s, which are um, very desmoplastic but have a um, high immune signature, and then you have the, T2, the C2 subgroups, which are TIL-rich and very high expression of those immune-related genes, 
Not too sure what to make of C4, so I've got a question mark over that. And then the C5 subgroup, which are what we would term as immunologically cold tumours. And whether this could be an important or some way of using it as a biomarker um, to identify um, patients for immunotherapy combinations based on this um, immunological um, differences. So I guess that leads us to Beacon. So um, Beacon stands for Bevacizumab, Atizolizumab and Cobimetinib in targeting the C1 subtype of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And, um, yeah, I'm very grateful for um, Danny Rishan and David Botel to um, give me the opportunity to lead this trial. Um, it's been a, a big body of work, and um, we're very, um, we, we've been very pleased to have everything lined up now, and we're hoping to have our site initiation visit at the end of the month. So we're very excited um, to get that up and running. Um, so this, patient's, this, uh, this study will pre-screen up to 200 patients for their molecular subtype using their archival surgical material. And for patients who have been identified as having a C1 molecular subtype, they'll be um, enrolled into the study and have a pre-treatment biopsy, followed by a run-in period of cobimetinib, a MEK inhibitor, and bevacizumab. And then another biopsy after that, and then go on to the triplet combination until progression. There are, this study um, is an investigator initiated study that's funded through the IMCOR Alliance, which is an um, initiative from Royce Genentech to support investigator initiated studies in um, immuno-oncology. So the basis of this study was that desmoplasia is associated with a high expression of TGF-beta, and it's, TGF-beta is subsequently regulated by pathways including RAS, RAF, MEK, and that MEK inhibition has been shown to alter desmoplasia and enhance immune response and immune checkpoint blockade. Um, so there's a number of different groups. I think Peter mentioned this morning already that they have a trial in breast cancer, in triple negative breast cancer, using a MEK inhibitor and um, chemotherapy. Um, and there are similar studies in melanoma and colorectal cancer. Um, VEGF. I think VEGF is really interesting, actually. I mean, um, obviously... Um, Gynecological oncologists and, and medonks treating um, gynec cancers have had a lot of experience using bevacizumab. Um, and I think, you know, in the past we thought of it as its role for um, targeting angiogenesis, but I think more and more people are recognising its role in, um, in enhancing immune response. And certainly in this really nice study published in Nature Comms in renal cell cancer, they were able to show that even with one dose of bevacizumab, that seemed to increase um, expression of MHC class 1, which is important for antigen presentation. It potentiates T cell migration, and it can increase the expression of other T cell effector markers. So that's the um, hypothesis or um, rationale for combining all of these three agents. Um, this is just to highlight that this is the type of assay that we're going to use to identify patients with the C1 molecular subtype. Um, again, um, um, led by Hui San Leong, who was a postdoc in David's lab previously, um, so that patients will have their tumour um, um, RNA extracted, run on the nanostring platform, and um, the bioinformatics team at Peter Mac have um, implemented an analysis pipeline to generate a report that will be issued back to the treating clinician. And then this is the study schema, and you'll see that we've ambitiously planned for uh, at least three and potentially four um, tumour-related biopsies. Um, you know, I think some of the um, feedback has been that, you know, this is obviously a very ambitious um, plan, but, um, you know, I'm a strong believer in that, that, that we need to understand the biology of these diseases and how they respond to treatment and what changes we identify in the tumours is critical to understanding whether these drugs are working or not working. I think hundreds of thousands of women have been recruited to clinical trials of various different agents over the years that have all unfortunately been negative, and we don't really have good ideas as to why. And I think this is, you know, a, a tremendous opportunity to, to learn. I think we've, you know, been, um, you know, with the developments in technology and being able to... Um, assay these samples um, thoroughly and rigorously, um, you know, we'll be able to learn. And, you know, I don't think this will be the last study um, in this context, and really, hopefully, these studies will help inform the subsequent future studies. Um, and these are just some of the work that's already um, been planned for some of the samples that we're um, hoping to collect. So thank you very much. Um, that's all I've got for today. Um.